actually a former student of UL. She graduated with a degree in uh, European studies here, and she's one of the most experienced uh, producers in RTE. She's worked in RTE since 1995, and before taking up her current position, she was a serious producer on the Today with Sean O'Rourke program and a producer with Today with Pat Kenny. She's also worked as a producer on Tonight with Vincent Brown, which was a radio program before his current television program on RT Radio 1. She was a presenter of Rattlebag and Morning Glory, also on radio. She also presented Women and Words on Lyric FM and did a series of interviews with the Irish authors for the National Library of Ireland Library Late series. She's from Granan County, Limerick, and was the first arts officer to be appointed um, to a local authority uh, in County Clare in 1985. So today she's going to talk to you about reporting opportunities in radio and producing current affairs programmes. So I'd like you to give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was a student here. Um, I did European studies. I graduated in the early 1980s. And I think I did European studies then because there was only one other media course, and that was uh, what is DIT now. It was the Rathmine School of Journalism at the time. So we did politics, obviously, and European affairs, and, and it was kind of a training ground. I felt for the media. But um, the way things happened anyway at the time, the arts were very exciting in this area, in the Midwest and in, in the west of Ireland, between Druid starting up, the Galway Arts Festival starting up, and I just got into the arts for a time. So it wasn't until 1993 that I just thought, well, if I'm going to do this journalism thing, I'm going to have to give up my job and start. So I'm just going to talk away a little bit about how I got into journalism myself, then talk about maybe producing uh, a radio program. But mainly, it's to give you ideas about how you could get involved in radio yourselves. So the best thing is, I don't mind being stopped or asked a question as we go along. And don't worry if you think the question is stupid because it's, you know, we only find out how, how, to get, you know, how to get into things like radio by asking people. I got into radio because I knew somebody. Uh, there was, um, I had taken a, I had given up my job in the National Youth Council as arts officer. I was doing some freelance journalism in arts for the Irish Times, doing um, women's magazines, writing articles for women's magazines. <coughs> and then a friend of mine who was working in RTE said that two people from the Today with Pat Kenny show at that time uh, had gone on study leave and would I come in for, I think it was four weeks as a researcher. And I don't know if you know, radio programs are made up of, let's say, producers, um, researchers, and then broadcasting assistants, reporters, and then the presenter, obviously. And um, I was brought in as a researcher, and I, uh, if I think if I had applied to be a researcher, I'd have never got the job, because they'd have seen my CD, CV, they'd have seen that it was all about arts administration, whereas like, I had a very strong grounding in politics, knew a lot about politics, both from my degree and from the kind of people I knew. Um, so I was able to do very well as a researcher there, and they kept keeping me on and keeping me on. Uh, you know, on very bad contracts, but at least for me it was great. I was getting more experience, and and then just luckily that October, um, uh, one of the producer courses came up in RTE. They only come up about it used to be about once every two years. I think if you're lucky, it's once every four years now. And I went for the interview and got that, and then have been working there ever since. But I've had a real variety, varied and great variety of experiences there, from being a researcher, to being a reporter, to being a presenter, to being a series producer. I've got the chance to um, you know, do the Simon Combers Fund, which I'm sure you know, which is a fund that funds people to do development documentaries. I've been to Haiti, and I've been to Sierra Leone, and I've been to the Philippines. We've also through today with Pat Kenny show, we would have taken the whole team, um, uh, well, small teams from within the team, let's say a team of three, we covered the uh, Rugby World Cup in France, we covered the um, <coughs> European Championships in the dance. So you can have a really varied and interesting life 
you know, as a radio producer, and then you can go off and maybe do a few reports or become a reporter. There's a lots of people in RTE who would have got in as a producer, like Philip Boucher Hayes, Fergal Keane, those people who do the Drive Time show, and they're now full-time reporters. So do you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about RTE programs? Do any of you listen to RTE? How many? Very good, okay. You've you all listened to today with Pat Kenny and uh, Sean O'Rourke, have you? Well, you would have an idea that it's yeah. a, a current affairs, current affairs program. magazine program. So the idea is that for maybe the first half of the program, you would cover the breaking story of the day. Then, so that would be all organized. We get in at seven o'clock in the morning, the team. Um, you, li you find out what the list for Morning Ireland is. You know Morning Ireland is the morning show that does all current affairs. And usually, if, if there's an issue about education, they have the Minister for Education on. So we've got to listen to what he's saying, and for that first half hour, we'll plan maybe a two-hander, a fight between maybe somebody from the ASTI and maybe the junior minister in the department. So that's what you're doing, you're saying, well, why can't, you're trying to think of the idea that would move the story on or debate the story that's come up on Morning Ireland. You could also get a reporter maybe to go out and do a box pop. Or this week, for example, we would have had a reporter down at the teachers' conferences. So she or he would be reporting back with clips and a script. Equally, for example, I was thinking, um, and we might play one, one of yeah. the clips the uh, Paddy O'Gorman clip, which um, you know the big controversy there was about the, um, uh, the, the taping of telephone calls. And Paddy, what Paddy does is he would go to dole offices, to um, outside the gates of prisons, just to talk to the dispossessed of society to see what their view is on breaking stories. And in, it would be the Paddy O'Gorman, one which I think is the second, if you don't mind. Um, this is Paddy, so he goes to a prison, I'm nearly sure, uh, Sean will introduce it, and you just see the kind of report he does. And you maybe have a listen and have a think then, maybe you might want to ask me questions, questions about yeah. that. Okay. You have been going behind the headlines about the inadvertent uh, recording of 84 phone calls between the prisoners and their solicitors. You've been talking to people up and around uh, Mount Joy, so what have you been able to establish? Well, people are very sceptical that it was inadvertent, but people seem to think this is visitors that you'll meet and also prisoners signing on, because people are there signing on for the duration of the sentence, so you'll meet both categories of people there. But everybody uh, says they believe they are routinely monitored, which they accept even though they don't like, and they believe they are routinely recorded. And so nobody is surprised at the, at the idea of recordings. And they also, uh, when I said to people, look, what do you think about that was inadvertently recorded? People will scoff at that. And perhaps we live in a, in a cynical era, but that is, that is their belief. So I'm going to um, start off with um, actually a prisoner that I met coming out of Mount Joy. I didn't realize she was a prisoner when I spoke to her first of all, but she, she's again signing on for the duration of her sentence. She was getting two phone calls today because um, you have different types of status. You have an enhanced status, means you'll be allowed two six-minute phone calls. You get that for good behavior. You have to earn that up until then. You'll only get the one phone call. So this woman, uh, she was on enhanced <laughs> status. If you're on the hands, you get two phone calls. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you get the one phone call. They're about six minutes. Sometimes, like you, you know, you're getting your privacy, but other times you can hear the beeps of it being recorded or <coughs> stuff like that. Were you visiting a prisoner just now? No, I had to sign on. Have you much longer to sign on for now? Six weeks. Another six weeks. Six weeks of nine months. I was in there for nine months, and then nine months of signing on. I was there. I, I don't what I done wrong, but you're paying the price for it while you're in there. I think you should at least have that little bit of privacy because you don't have a lot of privacy in anything you're doing. So you talk to your family, your mum and dad or I talk to my mum or my partner, my kids, that kind of stuff and, and do you <laughs> think that it, they're entitled to listen at least? No. No. Okay. Because when you're in there that's your only kind of way of speaking to your loved ones and you don't feel like you can say what you want because you know that there's somebody listening to you. Did you ever speak to a solicitor on the phone when you were in there and to your mother? Yeah, I spoke a couple of times to solicitors. As far as I know, all calls are recorded. It's not just family calls, it is solicitors' calls also. And then, like, you know, even if you're talking to your partner and 
it, even so much of saying how much you love them or that kind of stuff, it's embarrassing because you know somebody's listening in to you. So even when you're on a visit, like you're being, every movie you make is being watched, and not all of us are on drugs, so I am, and I've never been on drugs before, so. So, you see the idea there that, uh, now Paddy is employed by RT, but he would have gone off and he would have said, you know, I'm sure we were all talking about the Sophia Tuscan Duplantier case and about, you know, was he wearing Bailey's calls being recorded. And that was the kind of the, the story that was being highlighted. But there a reporter went off and found a new and refreshing angle. People who obviously, you know, from you can tell from their accents there, they, they don't probably have a posh solicitor to defend them. And there they are now worried about their own security and privacy in terms of phone calls. So equally, a freelance person, if you were listening and reading about the, the taping of calls in, in, in police stations or in prisons, you could equally come up with an idea like that. Nobody can get into the prison, so Petty has to stand outside the prison. Anybody can do it. It's just to have, well, I suppose maybe the contact first of all. You know it's a, you know it's a pertinent story to what's happening. You have made contact with the producers so that you then can ring up the producer and say, well, I was thinking about this. It's all about Ian Bailey and whether his calls were recorded. But what about ordinary, decent, Prisoners, what about their cause? Are they worried about security? And then you go off and you do that, and then you come in and you have your script. Did Petty have any extreme information? I don't think so. I think he had read news reports and knew the story very well. And then he had, on top of this, the opinion of ordinary prisoners and, and prison visitors that he came upon. So in terms of ideas, and how you can get into reporting, I think that could be a very good example. You okay? Do you want to, uh, just ask me if you want to ask Yeah, that anything. is, I think maybe what you might help them as well. See, a lot of them have done, um, you know, uh, modules in radio <coughs> reporting, but uh, where you might help them is, you know, how do you pick up, you know, you pick up the phone and you ask to speak to the producer on sure. the program. Um, what is it that you need from somebody when they ring you up? Um, you know, you're obviously very busy, so what kind of tips would you give them for pitching stories? Okay, uh, there's another example I'm going to play, which is the one about the toilet. Um, Brian O'Connell is um, now uh, employed by RTE. When I knew him first, he was a freelance writer. Um, he did some work for the Irish Times, and when I was working as a producer on an art show, he pitched some ideas to me out of the blue. I think it was mainly, to, could he go and review some theatre? He was based in the Munster area, so the attractive thing was he would be going to theatre that we wouldn't have other people to go and review. So yes, we used him a few times as a reviewer. So then, when I moved to the, to the Today Show, he again approached me. I knew then that well, he was pretty good in terms of being able to um, you know, do reviews. And I said, well, you know, Brian, can you record? And he said, well, you know, I think I'll get the equipment. So he got equipment. And we'd have, like, short conversations like this. I said, I think, well, it would be a good idea. I can, I can loan you a recorder if you like, because I had a recorder. And so I gave him a load of it. So I think, I think I never got it back, but I think for a number <laughs> of months he was using my recorder. He's got more sophisticated ones since then. And sure, there was a few disasters. He started playing around with um, uh, stereo at one time, and he was in a second-hand shop, and I could hear the hangers clink clinking off each other, but I couldn't hear the conversation. I said, yeah, it's very moody and atmospheric, but I don't know what anybody's saying, because I, all I can hear, you know, obviously he had the stereo where it was all on the hangers and not on the people speaking. So, but because I knew he was committed, because I knew he had done good stuff at the time. You are committed to people. Now you might be not have an awful lot of time one day, but then by keeping sending in ideas, you say, all right, shall we try that again? And then, like, producers have to listen to the clips. 
they might say, oh yeah, the first two are great, Brian, but maybe we'll drop the third one, and I'd really like to cut down the fourth one. And if he's there, I'll ask him to edit it. Usually I did it myself. Then I'd look at the script and I'd say, yeah, that script's okay, but maybe you're giving away the first clip in what you're intending to say um, in the first question. So, the example we're going to hear is, and I wanted to make this point to Mary. Brian is from Cork. He's from, he's from Clare, he lives in Cork, and he, but he would keep an eye out about stories in Ennis, in Cork, in Limerick, Tipperary. And that is such, like, yes, if I need somebody like Ralph Regal, he will go down and do a phone call with us. But somebody to do tape in this area is very difficult to find. So sometimes what you think is your, um, maybe um, a handicap because you're not near RTE, you can't go in and meet people. What you are near is near original stories that we wouldn't get or even have a sniff of up in RTE. And I think this is what Brian has developed very well. So I think it's very important to just keep, even though you have to keep your idea on the national story, going back to Paddy's, you can keep your eye on the national story, but you could pitch yourself outside Limerick Jail or pitch yourself outside Cork Jail to do a report like Paddy's. So anyway, Brian was in Ennis and he met a fellow journalist friend of his who tipped him off about the story he was working on, which he was going to have in the Cork Examiner the following day, and very kindly told Brian the same story. And Brian did it that evening in Ennis and turned up with it, and it was the opening story on our program the next day. So that's Brian going from small reviews on a late night art show to programs opening a 300,000 listener show. It's not bad, you know, no, over, yeah. over a number of years. So, at the... the we live in a toilet. Yeah. This is the shocking headline in today's Irish Sun in an article by Gordon Deacon about two immigrants who came to Ireland <laughs> with the dream of a new life, fell on hard times, and are now forced to live in public toilets in Ennis in County Clare. I'm joined from our Limerick studio by reporter Brian O'Connell, who's been to Ennis to meet one of the men, the Polish immigrant Peter Barham. Uh, good morning, Brian. Good morning, Pat. I gather that both of these men are well known in Ennis. Did you have much tr trouble finding them? I know it's a small town, but it would have been pretty dark and wet when you got there. Yeah, I didn't have any trouble, Pat. It was about half past nine when I arrived in Ennis last night, and there really are only two prominent public toilets in the town. Um, these are the kind of self-cleaning types of toilets with curved doors. I think they cost 25 cents to use them. So I bumped into local photographer Eamon Ward and he had met both men earlier yesterday. Uh, in the market area we could see the toilet had an occupied light on outside. There wasn't anybody around. There was two unopened cans of beer outside and we knocked on the toilet door and within minutes Peter scrambled to his feet and opened the door. He made a bed on the ground. The toilet itself was pretty dirty inside with human feces around the rim. And he had his shoes off, Pat, and was drying them. Uh, there was a bottle of vodka and a can of Linden Village cider on one side. He had two plastic bags which he used to wrap up his bedding. Uh, he had a coat, two small duvets and a fleece top. This was really, to all intents and purposes, his home. And he began by telling you just how he ended up living in a toilet. My situation is... I am... Um the homeless person and the toilet, public toilet. So on the ground here you have your duvet and your, I see your shoes are, are up here. You're trying to dry yes. your shoes, are you? Yes, correct. Nobody coming here. Only weekend, Saturday evening, Sunday evening. How long have you been living in here? How long? Two months. Is alcohol a problem? Is that your main problem? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I am alcoholic when I don't have the can of beer and uh, little be vodka. If I don't have this, tomorrow I go to hospital. You start shaking, yeah. Yes, I go to priest, the cathedral, and the bathroom for the shower, shaving as well. So the priest allows you to go into yes. his house to have a shower and a Correct, shave? Yes, now I have two jacket to the pillow. This blanket. And one blanket you have on the ground and then you put the second blanket on top. Yes, because you know, you see? The ground has got uh, grooves on it. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it's very cold. And for two months you've been living here? Yes, 
I must go in here at 10 o'clock, like now, must go out half six, sleep five hours per day. I am tired. Saying there, Pat, is that the toilets are serviced first thing every morning, so he has to leave about half six. And obviously if the occupied sign is on, nobody will bother him and he gets in there just after 10. Now he had worked all his life when he was living in Germany and Poland in a variety of work from manual labour to catering. He came to Ireland in about 2007 and like many persons who have found himself homeless, he is too proud really to tell his family back home how things have turned out. When I ring, when I ring to Poland, I say everything is okay. You know, I lie. So you see, you stay with the <coughs> accent, I think, because it's such a fascinating story that somebody is actually living in a public toilet. And then two clips later, there's a great scene when, where he goes and visits his friend who's living in another public toilet. And he knocks at the door. The other friend is very drunk, <coughs> and he has very little English. But it doesn't matter. You know, he's cursing and swearing in Polish. You know, you get that. And but you get this fact as well that they're friends. So there's this really kind of nice bonding between them. And it's it's a really lovely piece. And he, um, I I think he won a, a, a PPI award, the the, uh, the broadcasting award for that work. And subsequently, and not that guy, but the other guy died. So there was a follow-up story about where, where he played some of the old tapes and then went and talked to some, like the priest he knew, and talked to them about the, the tragedy of these two men who, and you know, it's telling the bigger story about immigration and the sadness of immigration. But again, it was like, because Brian just happened to be in the right place in the right time, which happened to be in his town, and he got a tip off from, from that. Um, as, as Mary said, I'm from Grana, which is out the um, Cork Road, and um, I have nieces and nephews still living in Grana, and I remember taking them to a dog show in Croom. And um, there I was working, I was presenting this show called Morning Glory at the time, it was the Saturday morning show. And we were, we were always looking for quirky stories. So there was this woman there, a very old lady, with one of those huge um, Irish wolfhounds. And, um, and I went over admiring the dog. And we got talking, and she seemed very interesting. And uh, she invited me over to her house someday. So a few weeks later, anyway, when I was down home again, she lived near Brough. I mean, it was so hard to find. She lived in a mobile fo home. She had dogs, rescue dogs that she rescued herself, living in cages, Dobermans, living in cages, wild things, savage things. Then she had a dog in the house that she had chained down with about three different chains. I was terrified. And then I went into the mobile home and there was dogs howling, chains jangling, fantastic recordings. I couldn't wait to get out of there. But then she had this fascinating story about the dogs she rescued, about rescuing dogs from the porn industry, and how she had to, you know, they were like almost unbelievable, but I do believe that they were true stories, and stories about one of her dogs having killed somebody, and it was just unbelievable, but fascinating stuff, and I met her at a groom dog show. So it's just to keep your ear out, see what's unusual, you all have recorders at this stage, do you, or a way of recording stuff? Yeah, they mm. use Marantzes here in college, but they, a good few of them have their own. Mm. They, you know, yeah. Yes, and even, yeah. even mobile phones now have uh, very good quality recordings. So it's just good to, to just keep, keep your ears open for ideas. But of course, the other side of that is then to know what show to sell this stuff to. And that's where listening comes in, and just know know what what today with our work is like. Like at the moment, it has, for example, uh, three reporters working on it. It's got Brian O'Connell, it's got Petty O'Gorman, which you see examples of there, and then you have Valerie Cox. And the usual way we do reports now is people come in. So let's say Mary's the presenter and I'm the reporter. And like that, I, cue, I talk to Mary and I cue the clips. 
Now that's a kind of newer way because it's about, I suppose, giving centrality to the presenter. Whereas before, you'd go away from the presenter and I notice in news talk they do that like the, the Davenport um, travel pieces. Like they'll go away from Pat for about seven minutes and he'll do a beautifully crafted piece about travel or about history. That is seen as a little bit old fashioned now in RTE, especially when you want, because you're paying your presenter so much, you want them up front all the time and interacting with the reporter. I think what's gone out a bit, which is a pity, is the beautifully crafted. As you saw there, those clips are not beautifully crafted. There's some of the sound is a bit off, you know, if you were going to be uh, nitpicking about it. But then there are some people like Ella McSweeney, you know, who does the Ear to the Ground program. She does some farming reports for us, and she does beautifully crafted pieces where she'd be out in the field, and you'd know that she had done many, um, I'm sure you do loads of layered kind of reports, don't you, where you put wild track in under a conversation to give it atmos. You know, they, they, they are the most beautiful. And I think you could have both of that. I mean, I think there's a bit of it later on in Brian's where he walks with the, the one Polish guy to the other toilet. There's the opening of the door. Some people forget the basic things of, you know, you want to say that you are coming here, I'm sitting down, and I'm meeting you all. And then I'm going to talk to Mary now. Hello, Mary. Whereas usually people will start with, and I asked Mary, how was she? And it starts with Mary. Which is, okay, that's fine if we're here in this kind of beautiful, but you know, uh, very clean environment. But if I'm visiting Mary in a haunted site, that's just such a waste of atmosphere, of the opening of the door, the, you know, what I was explaining earlier, the dogs barking, that idea that, you know, God, it's a bit scary, isn't it? You know, those dogs are jumping against the chains. You can't just tell that a lot of the time. You have to let it be heard in sound. And then a lot of the time as well, now this is more a producer's gig, but I can't see why those of you won't be producers, and it's always good to have a producer's eye as well. Like, when we would be on outside broadcast, that's when we bring the whole programme with us. And, for example, I. I think I might have done one with Sean, but mainly with Pat, we would have gone, let's say, to the European Championships in Gdansk. So why, so we'd have had two producers and uh, Pat Kenny. So we would use Pat as the reporter. So we would have Pat there and he's, uh, and, and he'd have the recorder with him or I'd be holding the recorder. And he'd go out and do box pops with the very drunken fans. In fact, I was telling Mary, we were trying to do, obviously going to Gdansk for the European Championship, costs a fortune. So you're trying to say to RT, we can do it, we can do two shows. The roadcaster is already there for 2FM. Uh, Hector was out there for the two weeks. We can do our show from the roadcaster. And um, two producers who can edit can do, take lots of tape during the day and then edit it. But of course, what we didn't take into account was that the wonderful Green Army get very drunk. And you are going around with one of the most famous people in Ireland. And of course, there's the selfies. And I don't know if there were selfies then, but they were. I was the official photographer. They'd go, pa, pa, pa. And then they'd be holding Pat like this, sloshing beer up on top of him because they were drinking it all hours. We'd be taking the photograph. Then, at one stage, I was back in the hotel room editing because we had to, let's say, any reports we did, then we'd have to edit, so we'd have chunks of the program for the live program the next day. And my colleague, Deirdre, went down um, the street with Pat, and Pat was caught, put up on everybody's shoulders, <laughs> hoisted around the place, beer again slashing everywhere. My God, there must be really be some awful security or insurance thing that I haven't thought out here because that's the, but again, you know, sometimes rather than having your presenter in the roadcaster and then everybody coming in with reports they've done, it's as good to have the, your presenter out there meeting the, the supporters and commentating on the match. 
Do you want to ask any questions? Just about, so another way of pitching is obviously to to send an email. And how can you find out what the email is? Okay. At the end of every radio show, they name the producer. On a Friday, they name the producer and the producer in charge. And the way you contact people in RTE is, let's say, me, for example, it's Kay Sheehy. So today's program was produced by the series producer Kay Sheehy. So if you want to contact me, you go k.sheehy at rte.ie or mary.dundon at rte.ie. That's, that's, how, that's how you know their, their names. Um, then, uh, so you might pick, um, who's the current producer? Uh, um, Hugh Ormond is the current producer of the Today Show. So you might say something like, Hugh, I really like Paddy O'Gorman's reports. I've been thinking about that story in, um, uh, to do with the, 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 um, the, the, the recording of um, people's phone calls. And I was thinking, I'm based in Limerick, and I was thinking, what if I spent a day outside Limerick jail and edited the report of what prisoners and prisoner visitors are saying about their, their telephone calls being recorded? And then instead of saying, I have, I have, I'm recently graduated, I'm a very good recordist, and look, I'll send you this, see what you, I'll send you one of the clips and see what you think. It's not a bad start, is it? You could do that. You could edit it down to about, let's say, 40 seconds send it as an attachment in the email. Don't send 10 attachments, because then they can't open their email. Do you know? So don't yeah. send 10 minutes, Overloaded. send 40 seconds, which would show, and send your best bit. And you know, they might use you that day, because they might, they, they might ring you back or email you back and say, sorry, we've just sent, you know, it's a great idea, we've just, we've just sent Paddy O'Gorman down to Cork, but good idea, you know, gives another idea again. Or you might say, um, dear Kay, I know you, or dear Hugh at this stage, I know you produced today with Sean O'Rourke's show. I have a great story from, from Ennis. Uh, it's about homeless people living in a toilet. Uh, would it be okay if I rang you after the show? Don't ring them during the show. What time is the show on from? The show is on from 7, you know, they start up until 12 o'clock. So ring them at 12 or 12.30 or 1 o'clock. They work through lunch. But you know, try and use your head. Don't ring them when they're up against the deadline at five to ten. That's when everybody rings you, and it's the last time. You know, and and you and you'll also forget that somebody's rang with a great idea, or you have written your name in a piece of paper, and I won't be able to find it because you yeah. rang me just when I was coming up to air. So then, uh, I might ring you back then, and I'd say, "All right, okay, and how are you going to record that?" And have you any done any recording before? And how are you going to send it to me? So would you be able to answer all those questions? Send it in an email. Send it by. We send it. Yeah. I'll come in to you. You know. Yeah. You know. Just be have ready. You have your answers. Yeah. yeah. And then um, uh, this is just an example of that um, script that Brian has. I, I didn't because I couldn't bring them all down. But you can just pass them around. As you see. It isn't the intro we use. This is a very pedantic kind of intro. I'm sure Brian won't mind me criticizing it. So we would have said, "Living in, I'm living in a toilet, or living in a toilet. That's a much more yeah. headline grabbing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep keeping it. I suppose the other thing came So they're just an example of the intro and where Brian will introduce the different clips. Yeah. Like some of them might be saying, you know, Brian got that story because it was going to be in the examiner the next day. But like a real source of good stories that a lot of the programs in RT would want, because they don't have people down the country, would to look at your own local paper. The local paper is, of course, and, I'd, and I would say that that story might have been in a local paper, because why did the local yeah. guy get to know about it? So I'm saying he tipped Brian off, but I'd say he was tipped off yeah. equally. And before, it's interesting, before, um, uh, RT used, all the programs used to get the regional papers in. But now they don't get the regional papers in. So what you're supposed to do is look them up online. But of course, between social media and looking 
looking up the, the national and the English papers, you don't have time to do the regional papers. So you have really, and for example, you know, there isn't there the observer in the Cork area. I often read that paper at home. I never get that. You know, there are local papers, and then there's the sub sub -lo local yeah. papers that you get you get a story in. So um, and equally local radio. Local radio has fantastic stories again, and you know, really interesting um, politicians. You know, politicians who would say maybe very right-wing things on a local radio station that they would never say on a national radio station. Mm -hmm. And again, you <coughs> could go out and pursue them, and and especially if it kind of if they're running for the local election, if they're saying something maybe about. Um, immigration, about religion, about, you know, you know yourself, but it's to keep abreast of what's happening in the national papers and try and make it relevant then through the stories you read in local papers. Do you know, Kay, if you had an idea, what always strikes me listening to RT is the fact that there nearly seems to be a conspiracy between RT and, or indeed any radio station, and the telephone services because so much of the radio that's on seems to be based on like direct comment maybe to a story or what I'm getting at is, for instance, if you compare it with something like Radio 4 and BBC, there are a lot of actually scripted programs around a given topic and there doesn't seem to be that sort of thing. Now, I'm not somebody that's able to listen to radio all day, every day or anything like that, but I've listened to enough to know that the major things seem to be around the topicality of the story and people's reactions to it. So even some stuff like Joe Duffy mm -hmm. would be people burning about the water charges or whatever, you yes. know. And you don't get this thing, like for instance at the moment, uh, in my own life situation, I'm very interested in stuff to do with pensions, retirement, safe place to put money, all that sort of stuff. And there's no actual, that I'm aware of, program during a daytime time that, that one might hear it, where you'd hear like a program on a given topic, if you get me. I know the arts programs, I know a, a little bit about the Saturday evening mm -hmm. programs, which are very interesting. I love the new book program, for example. But I, do you know what I'm getting at? And yes. I'm just wondering what that's about. Well, I suppose there'd be a lot of things in terms of RT policy we wouldn't agree with, like the whole uh, pushing to the, the edges, things like arts and um, you know, the book program, the arts program, the science program, the history program, all very good programs, but none of those are mainstream anymore. So what what has happened instead is that the daily programs, I know that we've done a number of items, let's say, on the Today Show, on pensions, for example. We've done a lot on history. Uh, you know, in some ways, the, the, um, the pushing the arts programs into the margins has freed us up to do a lot more arts. That's if the people in charge of those programs are into the arts. And that, that would vary from program to program. And of course, it depends on the presenter as well, how at home, let's say, with something like the arts are. So yeah, I think there is, that is more RT policy, though. And I think it's about you know being current, because that seems to be where I'm sure our local radio person would agree, Absolutely. that is where the listenership is. Yes. You know, the evening programs get hardly anybody. You know, you're talking about 30,000. We're talking daytime programs, 300,000. So, I think you understand. Now, the other, but there are other areas, and I'm so glad you brought them up. Sunday Miscellany, I don't know if you ever listened to it. It's got about 300,000 listeners to a program about creative writing. And it's, it's, um, they're usually about 300 words, a script, and people, uh, so you write your own script, and you then, you send it in to the, um, uh, the producer, cleanna.neonblue at rte.ie, and it, you, then if she chooses that, she might choose it and say, well, you know, it's not a great start, but you know, she might want to edit it a bit. Then you would come in on a given day and you would read that script. So that's more creative writing. So it might be, let's say, it's nice if, it's, it's, if, if it is a bit maybe pertinent. Usually, for example, she'd do something coming in up to the Perlin final 
or maybe the World Cup, or I'm just talking about sport now, or I think she's doing a Seamus Heaney one very soon. So, and I don't think you have to be a Heaney expert. It could be, you know, you doing a, a Heaney poem for, for, for your midterm, you know, the midterm break when you were a kid, just making it your own. That's a listen, it's an hour-long listen at a nine, nine o'clock on a Sunday morning. Now, some people don't like it because it's, it's people's own voices reading these scripts. Some of the voices, you know, they're not professional readers. So some of the voices you like, some of the voices you won't like. But if you stick with it, you'll just see the way that they write these. It, it's a good um, exercise, yeah. I think, in writing the for craft, radio. Craft the story, yeah, yeah, craft the story. So usually it's about something personal and that goes in going from the personal to the general or going from the general to the personal. And if you see, if you listen to it, you'll see the way they're constructed. And I think it's a very good way. I, I did a few of those very early on in, in my journalistic career and it was great. Um, it was a great way of learning. The other thing then is the documentaries. Do you all listen to the documentaries on one? Yeah, and obviously, they're a great opportunity to get your work on the radio. Now again, they're difficult ones to, to, to like, what they like mainly is a very strong narrative. Let's say somebody's story that we can <coughs> go with from the beginning of, of the 45 minutes to the end. For example, I was talking about the Simon Compers Fund. Simon Compers is the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and the, their development section, which is, you know, third world aid or development aid. And they have a fund which was given in honor of Simon Compers, who was a cameraman who died uh, in action uh, as, a, as a cameraman. And they give funding to people who come up with good ideas around um, a pitch for a story. I'll give you a few pitches in a sec. And then you would have to ring me again or ring the head of the uh, documentaries and say, if I was to go to Sierra Leone, Kay, would you take uh, an item I'm thinking of doing on there? Now you'd be more specific about what that item would be. And I'd say, well, would they, would they Speaking, speaking to anybody who speaks English, or is it going to be a translator? I'm just trying to think of the question, so you need to be able to answer that. Um, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of recording experience have you got? Because, like, a lot of funds recently went to people going to refugee camps. <coughs> and again, if I'm in a refugee camp, and there is a refugee, okay? And I am coming in and I'm going, and then I have <coughs> two seconds of Mary and then the translator. Whereas I can walk through the camp and I can say, I'm now on the uh, Lebanon-Syrian border, all loads of sound of the truck arriving, the food being uh, given out, loads of people rushing, rushing feet to the lorry, I can be, I can just do that clear, just do the recording clear, not talk over it there. I can put the talking in afterwards, or if it's a long day, you can do a bit of both because talking and walking is also a good way of doing things. And always get loads of wild track because no matter what documentary you have, you'll always run out of material and it's the wild track you need. You know what wild track is, it's just the atmosphere, it might be talking, it might be animal sounds, it might be, you know, trucks arriving, trucks departing, just all that kind of stuff. So I just got out a few um, ideas here that they did in documentaries, which I thought were very good. I heard this one, it's a dog fight, and we're coming up to the local elections, and we're coming up to the European elections. And this was an excellent one they did between Conor Lennon and Charlie O'Connor. They're the two, that's his name, isn't it? Charlie yeah. O'Connor, yes. They're the two uh, the Fianna Fáil candidates for Talc. And it's, uh, one of them was going to lose their seat. Did they both lose their seat? I think they did. Yeah, both they, I think they right? actually yeah. both lost yeah. their yeah. seat in the end. But it was a dogfight, and it's called Dogfight, Connor and Charlie. And what the, um, and you often ask people to go canvassing, like you'd ask your reporter to go canvassing. Come back. You, 
If I ask somebody to go canvassing, I want to hear what's said at the canvass. I don't want the reporter interview Mary the candidate. I have no interest in what Mary the candidate should do the, the usual oh speak speak that anything. But I want to hear you at the door giving out to Mary and saying you'll get no, you know, what have you done if she's if she's a, a government candidate giving them all about water charges, this and that and the other. So this is very much what this um, producer did. And what he had was, he had a boom mic. You, yeah, you all know what a boom mic with the big stick. So he didn't have to be going, you know, standing beside Connor. He was actually at a distance, so he could go up to the door with Charlie, let's say. And so he was, he could let Charlie have a more purer conversation with the woman at the door. Yeah. Then equally, because he spent many a night. He didn't just spend one night. You won't get the masterpiece in one night. Yeah. You'll have to go out a few nights. And then what he got the payback then where the two teams met. I think that maybe, uh, it's a long time since I heard it now, Hatala a Station. And they had this dogfight dog fight between them, raging about, you took my territory, you took my territory. But you can imagine, uh, Karen Cassidy, like he must have gone out, I'd say, maybe for two weeks with these candidates. But a brilliant documentary. I, I leave these here so you can look yes. them up. You can look them up on the documentary website. Really, really, really good. Then I saw this one, which was very simple. I haven't heard it now, but I've done a number of these <coughs> uh, kind of uh, documentaries before. This is three people who work, who volunteer at the National Gallery and the reporter followed them around and talked to them about the paintings they loved in the National Gallery and why they loved them and finding out a bit about their lives as well. And then, um, then this one, which I thought was a great idea as well, this was an Indian who came back, who obviously they got in contact with, you know, there's, uh, it's that um, India, Air India Flight 182 that went down. Oh yeah, West Cork. West Cork. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the families come back because a, a, an awful lot of people were, about 300 people were lost yeah. Yeah. in that flight. So obviously they, they have made connections with West Cork. So obviously the um, Peter Woods who made the documentary must have got in contact with the people in <coughs> West Cork who said, well, we know this Indian guy, he comes back every year. So he did a documentary with the Indian, the Indian man who could, and I think the Indian man maybe did, they went to India and they also did stuff in West Cork. Then um, this, this sounds a lovely one again about a man away, you know, in a nursing home and they have, the nursing home they're in is closing down and so it's talking about, so all these old groups of friends are breaking up and they're moving to a new nursing home. So you have to spend a lot of time there. You have to spend time in the nursing home to get to know what it, what's the ordinary day like. Then you have to be there on the day they move. Then you have to be at the new places to see what they're like. So, you know, you have to give these things time or you won't get the key pieces of information that you like. I heard this one sex flights and videotapes. This is it's a great idea. It was about this guy who ran a pub <coughs> in, um, in, in, in Dublin, was it? In Ireland. And it was about sending, oh, yes. taping, you know, all Ireland finals in, in Dublin. This is when you couldn't get them in Britain. And then going on the flight over to Britain and putting them out, you know, duplicating them and putting them out then uh, in all the pubs Oops. in England. Obviously, it's over, but they were able to have, like, um, footage of those games, then talk to the guys who were involved in this enterprise. They got me Hall and Murahurti to be the comment, you know, the, the, the commentator. So it's just, it's just a very nice idea. One of the uh, Simon Cumber's ones I did was um, Filipino direct, um, domestic workers. So through, so I knew some people who worked um, and who had Filipino people working for them as childminders, but they were all very happy with Filipino workers. So I was interested in people who weren't having a good experience. 
So then I got onto the migrants' rights, and I met with a whole group of women from Africa, Philippines, various places. But I met this uh, wonderful woman called Neldi, and she had worked in Ireland for about ten years, and she had, you know, had pretty bad experiences for working for people in Ireland. And then her sister, she, she slowly brought out her sister, so there were three of them now living in Ireland. And she would tell us of their life in Ireland. Then, of course, it's all about remittances, about sending money back home. So Neldy was what, she was nearly, she was in her late 40s when I met her, and she had about five children at home. The eldest being, I would think, 18, and going down to two was the youngest when she left. So people, women, it was all women, the men couldn't get work anymore in the Philippines. So I went back then to the Philippines with her, met all her children, met other cousins whose, whose mothers were also either in America in, or in Ireland working. So in other words, there was a number of elements to the documentary that was being treated badly by Irish people. Celtic Tiger women treating these women badly. Then you went back and you had to look at her life all oh, right, she's really uh, not abandoned her children, they're being looked after by grandparents, but she is now living for a year in Ireland without seeing her children. She's on Skype and the like, but she thinks it's more important to get the money so that they can get an education to get them out of poverty. And the wonderful thing about that was going back, all her children were educated and they could speak very good English. They, some of the, uh, her sisters or sister-in-laws who had been in America, their children had very good you know, English as well. And some of them would talk about how they did miss their parents and how they knew that what they had done for them, the fact that they were getting this education, that they had got them out of poverty was great, but that they, the heartbreak was that they missed all this key time with their parents. So that was the documentary. And, and it worked because, of course, you had English speakers. And even though some people, now you would translate some of it, but very little. So that is a fund. I don't know, do you yeah. ever do that? We do. Um, yeah. Actually, Fiona, my colleague, won one of the awards, and one of our students this year, this year, year has won the student awards. The second student is going to Sierra Leone. Great, yeah. great, and uh, excellent. And um, in Sierra Leone, I, did, I covered um, um, a radio station there, which had been, which were very involved in peace and reconciliation post, um, post the, <coughs> the awful um, atrocities that had happened in Sierra Leone. And, um, and of course, it depends what time of the day. If it's morning Ireland and you have the Minister for Health in, he has about seven minutes, so you can go for it. If it's, if it's today with Sean O'Rourke and you have him on for maybe 20 minutes and you want a more discursive, that's when he can be just hell. Because you're you're getting you know you're trying you're and there you are as the producer saying take him on that get him on that get him on that because you're trying to just keep the dynamic going even though you know uh, even though you want because people have time to listen you want to give the person time to to make their point but you also don't want you know there's that time where the presenter can slightly go over and start completely agreeing with the interviewee or they have to come back and be the woman in the kitchen who is <coughs> screaming at the radio. So you as the producer have to try and manage that situation and you try and know where there's the exposition, the beginning of the interview where you let the person say, say what their point of view is. But then you also have to get a bit of edge into it. Now, mainly this will happen because the presenter is skilled and he knows to do that and he knows that that's, that that's what he's paid for, to, to get in under the skin of politicians. But you know, too, I remember, as Mary was saying, that I did work with, with Vincent Brown, and you know, it was great to learn the dynamics of, of that kind of more aggressive interviewing. You know, it was exciting. And also the, the, the nature of putting discussions together that you had to have, you know, I mean, counterpoint. But I know it sounds simple, but Oftentimes, when you're listening to radio, you have four people agreeing with them, yeah. and you think, 
who put this it's panel together? together. Yeah. You know, where is the dynamic? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you listen to programs and you have everybody from the middle class background mm -hmm. and everybody's agree, mm -hmm. And they're all saying banalities. And you think, who put this together? Where's the edge here? Mm -hmm. And yes, you can rely on the presenter to have a bit of an edge, but they're not going to take on four people yeah, yeah. opposite them. Yeah. So that is the skill in the production. Like, an awful lot of things can be lost in the office. It's too, it's too late sometimes to try and sort it down in the studio. Yeah. So that time in the morning where you finally got your, your two people set up, um, um, black against white, and then, and then you have to talk it through with your presenter and you say, I think you can get them on this. I think keep going on this. Don't give way on this. And then they might come back and say, I don't know, why is that a kind of a redundant argument? But have that conversation. It's very hard to have that conversation when they're yes. trying to listen to the two, the conversation, and you're saying, you know, what about this, what about that? Now, the great thing is we do now have messaging. So you don't have to be talking yeah. to people here. You can yeah. send in messages or the whole idea of social media and uh, text coming in which, you know, can kind of bring a dynamic that in, in something that's faltering a bit. So suddenly you're getting the critical people there, listening to the program on te on, in their kitchen who've texted in, and you send those texts into the presenter, and they're all, so they can start feeding that too, and that kind of brings another dynamic. Or clips as well is another dynamic. So you say, well, that's not what you said in the Dáil Minister, mm -hmm. and you play the Dáil. Yeah. Or that's not what Michal Martin said about you, Minister, you know. Yeah. So really to have all these kind of, um, you, you know, uh, skills uh, at your beck and call so that you can. Because some, some people will, like Pat Rabbit is a great interviewee, for example. He can, you can make him mad, you can make him happy, you know, he, he will mainly, he can be arrogant at times, you know, he's a very good interviewee. So you don't really need many of the trappings. Other ones who are very schooled, who are going to try and read the press release to you all the time, you need something as well as your skill presenter in that. Okay, very good. Uh, Gary, would you go? No? Um, um, just uh, she for you. Um, yeah, you were speaking about like when we pitch the idea and stuff. But um, what would be the time frame that people would get? Like, what time would they have to have it in for you to edit it and go through it before they go on air and that? Well, for example, would we take the two there? Um, I mean, if, if you had the the inner story, I'd want you to go out that night and have it turned around for me in the morning because I wouldn't want it to be on the newspaper yeah. before, especially if you're offering it fresh. Um, now, obviously, I'd help you with the editing if, if you could bring, if you could even get me some of the raw stuff. Um, but the the paddy one, you know, if you were offering that to me, I'd, I'd send you straight away, and I would want it the next day. Um, then something a bit more featurey, I, I could hold on to a bit longer. But then it might have its own, uh, you know, the event is on at the weekend; it'll have to go out by the weekend. We're trying not to do too many featurey things. It's so easy to do featurey things for current affairs yeah. programs, and really there's enough of it. Yeah. You know, try and keep your mind on current affairs and see, as you saw from those two reports, you don't have to know the politics of Ireland inside out. You just need to have, you know, the, the brain part to go down to a prison. Yeah. You know. But don't say there's a lovely cheese fair on because I have about 10 people <coughs> offering me the cheese fair and I have had 10 PR people offering me the cheese, cheese fair. Yeah. You want something with an edge? An edge, yeah. yeah. I, I just point out that, that the balance K of the mid-morning magazine show is, is one of the most challenging, isn't it? Because yes. Morning Ireland knows what it is. It's the hard news. You know, if, if it's a strand like art, you have you, some idea. When you're trying to get the balance right across mid-morning, it's tough for everybody, producers, researchers, presenters. Yes. I mean, I, I think what we would try to do um, on, um, I mean, Sean is a little different now, the Sean O'Rourke show, because he is uh, he is more news-driven than, than maybe the Pat Kenny show was. But maybe just to talk about the Pat Kenny show, which would be, 
um, which, anyway, because I, I suppose I know it better. Um, so we would start again the first half, it's a two hour show, so let's say the first half hour would definitely be the breaking, responding to the breaking news. You might do that uh, over a half an hour, so you might respond to two stories by two different elements. Then the half hour between half ten and eleven, you would probably have it um, organized. Now if you had, let's say somebody like an author, as big a name as Jeremy Paxman, for example, you would put him in at half ten because he's a big name. Then if it was, um, so, but if not, you would maybe have in the week that's in it, um, and if you weren't opening with education, maybe you'd be opening with David Moyes, you could have, let's say, your report and a, a two-hander on education. And then, coming up to 11, just with the last five minutes, just to do something different, you might go to a foreign news story. Then, out of 11, we do news and sport out of 11. And then, usually it's nice to keep that quick dynamic going and have something, maybe again, um, like a, a regional story, something slightly, uh, you know, that will keep the listener, something kind of quirky. And then, again, Let's say if you have a very good author, you know, an author but that mightn't be so well known or might be, let's say if you had Simon Shama, who is a very big name, but he might be doing his book on art rather than, uh, you know, a more populous book, you might put him on then at that quarter past 11 stage. That would get you down to half 11. And then again, you might have, let's say, three young people who are involved in the Irish dancing competition. So very Irish very nice, good, chatty people, and you might finish with a bit of music, or you might finish with another foreign story, or, um, yeah, that kind of thing. So, yeah, yes, yeah. you know, that's, isn't that what we're talking about? That yeah. kind of balance, so that it's not, so there's a chance for people to sit down and think, oh, great, um, Jeremy Paxson's going to be on talking about the Great War now for 20 minutes. I can just have my cup of tea and have yeah, a really relax. nice time. Or yeah. Simon Sham is going to talk about Caravaggio for 15 minutes. I'm going to enjoy it. You need the balance, don't you? You yeah. need the balance. And you'd find in your show too, Joe, that you know very often the, the text you get in, it does re-energise it, doesn't it? It does re-energise re yeah. it. Um, and that point that you make about having a facility to go with the breaking story yesterday morning into Tuesday, everything that we had lined up for Friday pretty much went out. The, the window with all the stuff that was happening, the David Moyes stuff and a couple of other issues. And that is tough because you come in at 7 o'clock, as you say, or whatever time, and you're trying to get the show on the air for 9. It can be really, really difficult. But if you don't do it, you lose because everybody else will be doing it. And yeah. also, the audience is amazingly intelligent and educated. The listener knows, even if they don't know, that it feels stale, you know. Yeah. But if you if, if you get it right, you get the first elements of it there that might be the, the, the current story of the day. And then you move to the big name, as you say, it feels natural to the to the listener. Yeah. You're so right, Joe. And the thing is to be able to throw out the whole program and to ha and to be brave enough to do it yeah. and have to make those awful phone calls and they'll say, I'm sorry but our event is going on tonight, it's no good to me now. I'm gonna say we are so sorry, but the world has fallen down, and we have to follow it. Yeah. yeah, and you have to do that, and you can you can hear lazy producers when it doesn't happen. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, a bit like the four people all agreeing with each other. It's lazy production, and it's boring. Yeah. And you know, you wonder afterwards why was that boring? And it's not boring because your presenter didn't do right by it. It's boring because you had the bad idea up above, yeah. and, and you know, and didn't fight it out then. Yeah. With, yeah. with your colleagues. Because yeah. argument or argument and discussion amongst yeah. your colleagues, that's where all the ideas come out. Right. Keep talking amongst your colleagues, you know, even even amongst yourselves. That's how ideas develop, you know. It's like you start with a half an idea. Um, I was just I was just saying to Mary that I'm working on commemoration at the moment. So, you know, you're talking to people about the Asgard for example, which is, uh, it's a hundred years since the gun running of the Asgard. Anyway, it's a big before you can. And, but you know, you talk yeah. to people, yeah. and people say, oh, um, 
Mary was even talking, because I was saying, I was in the National Library and I found all these um, logs that one of the women who was on the gun running boat kept. And it, it's just fascinating stuff and you could either dramatise it or you could go in and have somebody talking about it. And Mary was saying then, oh yeah, my family knew the Spring Rises, and she said that they were great, uh, or sorry, her, her well, my friends. My grandmother, no, yes, 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 yeah. yeah, but they knew, and you know, so they're great. They, are there people around still, I wonder, who knew them? Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, so by talking yeah, to people about what yeah. you're thinking about, yeah. you just get more and more ideas, you know, and that's how ideas develop, and even writing them down yourself in a pitch, you know, I leave these little pitches now, they're, they're the promo actually for the documentaries, but I'd say the pitch that they sent in the first place isn't completely a million miles away from that. So by writing the pitch, and don't, you know, people, are, people won't be stealing your ideas, it's really nice to give the idea yeah. to somebody yeah. and say, what do you think about that? And they'll say, but who's the subject of that? Yeah. You know, they might just ask you something simple like that will focus you. you know? But they are all on the documentary website. All I did yeah, was go to copy the documentary. And if you click on any of, they're under sport, they're under art, they're under uh, politics, you'll get the one about Charlie, the, the dog fight under politics, and you'll say Charlie, and, and then you'll see the pitch. Yeah. And just learn from what other people do and it. say, that's how you get a pitch together. Yeah. You do yeah. a brilliant one down yeah. here. Who are your, who are your, can you think of even somebody that they'd be a real dynamic? I think, I think the other thing is, uh, sorry, I meant to tell you this, is, um, you know, the, like there's the arena, the arts show. Yes. Well, they're always looking for good reviewers. I'm reviewing their, the impact book lists for them at the moment. And I was just talking to Mary early, earlier, like between reports, briefs, if you wanted to work as a researcher, and reviews, it's really about organizing information. You know, it's about knowing what something is about, what the hook is, and then after that, just getting your information in order. And, you know, not to go in reading your reviews, because it sounds like that. You might say beautiful lines, but you won't have the dynamic of me telling Mary like what a brilliant book it is, you know, and you might mispronounce a word or you might make a balls or something you had worked out about it, but it's much more spontaneous and people will want to either go to the movie or hate the movie, whatever, you know, they listen to you. So just, but if you have your information, if you know what it's about, if you've, if you've got maybe highlighted who's in it or the names of the characters, and listen to the people who are doing reviews. You know, just, yeah. I don't, it, there's just an awful lot of listening and say, do you like them, don't you like them? Why don't you like them? Does that sound a bit red? You know, and try, yeah. you, you know, passion. just li just listen, just listen at, in terms of trying to learn your own skill. Mm -hmm. But there are opportunities, and you know, <coughs> at the moment, you know, I'm sure you know you're not going to walk into a highly paid job. But so this is the time to experiment, to try and be writing an article and trying to do a review. If you get a book, let's say, to review, you get the book free, you might get a few bob for reviewing it at a newspaper, and then Joe or, or Arena might take you as a reviewer. Yeah. And you know, you don't have to just, there might not be an option for, for um, fiction books, but there might be, a, a political book where they might be able to get the author. You know, there's always really good books coming out of America about um, about power. In fact, in today's Irish Times, there's a, a guy, his name is Martin Wolf, and he's reviewing a book by a French economist who, and he's trying to make the point. There is time, you know, it, you know this economist isn't talking about social justice or the, um, the you know, sharing out the wealth. And Martin Wall is making the argument against the book. But that's not beyond any of you to read that kind of book and put your own spin on it. And you wouldn't be able to get the author because he probably speaks French anyway. So it's an, you know, it's an idea. Yeah. And they've all done other subjects like politics or whatever. And if, if you have a speciality or economics or whatever, you know, use that strength. strength use well. that strength. Yeah. Because I think that's, that's the, like my background was in the arts, so I had a push into arts programming. You know, the same with people like Fergie Keane, for example. He, he 
he has very good short hand and typing. So he gets down to do all the tribunals, yeah. and it's so very hard to turn that stuff around. Yeah. And he short hand and typing really sticks by him because I think you have to do short hand and typing. Oh, they all did it in the first yeah. year. Short hand is really useful. I've been down at tribunals. I don't know if you have, Joe, and it is very hard to do it in long hand. I just mentioned the BEI Sound and Vision Fund. Yes. Well. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Because you were asked that question earlier. There are various funds, and the Sound and Vision Fund is one that can be applied for <coughs> programs for RTE or independent radio or television. Um, and for example, we used it uh, in the context of a company called Grey Heron Media, which is based out of Kilfinnan, Dermot McIntyre. They won international and, and national awards for their documentaries. They did one for us in collaboration with uh, Dr. Pat Wallace, who's the retired director of the National Museum. He's from Limerick. Uh, as a contribution to City of Culture, which was different parts of Limerick City and County, like St. Mary's Cathedral, King John's Castle, Kilmarnock, etc., etc. They went, they got the funding, they employed it through the system, and made the program, and it's actually currently going out on the air. So th there are ways, and I know it's tough, and we've had some of you uh, with us in different guises over the last few months, and all of you have done an excellent job. Roshi there and, and others too. Shia from was in with us a few times. Frank's been in with us too. Um, it is hard. It's hard right now. Um, but the one thing I will say is I think just from our own perspective we're seeing a slight turn commercially which might mean there's a bit more freedom for RT <coughs> and, and, and independence to look <coughs> at bringing people on board. So be confident in, yeah. your, in yourself. Well, Absolutely. That's great. It's a good uh, optimistic note to, fit, to finish on anyway. Yeah. I'd like to thank Kay and thank Joe for coming. And, and